Michigan Peace and Liberty Coalition is proud to present the 5th Annual Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest. It will be held at the Circle Pine Center in Delton, Michigan, just outside of Kalamazoo, starting Thursday, June 22nd, and going through Monday, June 26th. That's right, Liberty Fest is getting longer and stronger. There will be presentations, discussions, bacon duels, and outdoor activities in an environment that is both family and grown-up friendly. There will be special appearances by Jeffrey Tucker, Dana Martin, and a few of the Freedom Fiends. If you have only talked about what a free society would look like, this is your chance to live it and see it with your own eyes. Now round up your friends and family and get them registered today at mplfest.org. And there is a discount for paying with Bitcoin. That's mplfest.org. Dogs welcome. Longer leashes recommended. And then I had nothing to do. Like I couldn't get unemployment or anything. So I did what any sane human being would do. And I'd read all these John Hopkins studies and I ate and ate the mushrooms <laughs> and uh, <laughs> went and spent some time in the woods or drove around my buddy's car and, and just asked some deep questions myself. Like, what am I supposed to do with my life? Like I'm miserable. I didn't mm. feel like I had a purpose. And Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 111th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, yep. we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. Is this episode number one, one, one? Uh, yes, it is. I'm not sure who that was supposed to be, but yes, Sean it is. Connery. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you. Okay, Sean. Uh, you're going to need to work I'm on Hardy that one. from... Uh, uh, Batman. <laughs> oh yeah, Bane. I yeah. thought you were supposed to be Bane there. I grew up in the darkness, Batman. Well, <laughs> well, we are back. I am Jeremy. I'm joined as always by Dave and Andre. What's up, guys? What's I'm having on, a guys? wonderful day. I'm glad. I'm glad to be here with you guys. Glad to he- be here with you, Drew. Glad always to be here with you. Haven't even Anarcho Andre. And uh, thanks for uh, hosting the show uh, t- tonight, I'm, I'm Jeremy. A, I'm, I'm going to stop introducing you, Dave. You just screw everything up. Anyway, well, good. <laughs> uh, we are brought to you this week by Discord and, as always, by Room for Freedom. And this week, our guest is Drew Sample, from who is the host of the Sample Hour podcast, which is fastly becoming one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. Uh, what's up, Drew? How you doing, man? Thanks for coming by. Hey, man, thanks for listening to the show and thanks for having me on, man. It's, uh, it's weird when you cool people start listening to you and then you, you get to connect with them and they invite you on their show so the honor is all cool mine people man. yeah cool you guys people. pretty cool uh, <laughs> that's awesome i'll take it yeah that's, that's debatable but we'll take it exactly um yes absolutely yeah uh well i i mean as i had mentioned to you i nick hazelton uh introduced me to your podcast a while back and uh i finally started listening and i i obviously because of this a lot of the stuff you talk about you do a lot of stuff about farming and and beekeeping and permaculture and like just all this different stuff that i'm very interested in because that's the kind of the lifestyle i'm trying to shift to and dave here is actually involved in you know he started i mean i'm living it (laughs) yeah he's living it right now down in alabama um so it was very interesting stuff and uh nick nick was actually the one who kind of convinced me to to start doing the farming type thing anyway i want to go into like animal type stuff like he does um but yeah, man, I, I, I love your show. I, I, it's, it's, it's always fun to listen to, and uh, I always learn something, so that's always great. That is good, man. I, I, um, I'm happy to hear that. Are we going to have to start our own wing of anarchy philosophy, uh, anarcho-farming? <laughs> so, uh, you know, man, it's kind of <laughs> weird. So we've just been, uh, me and my crew, that I kind of helped start with my, my uh, mother and fellow hillbilly, Greg Burns, uh, we're just kind of con. We kind of just have been embracing the term contrarianism. Um, a lot of us are kind of like we would probably. Le- I don't know. Getting we're trying to get away from the word just because of antifa, and then there's you 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 go into so man. I don't want to. I'm probably gonna piss people off, but <laughs> like you go into different anarchists like chats and different things like that, and then you quickly realize that. I have a lot less in common with a lot of these people than what I thought I did. (laughs) But then there's a lot of us that just kind of still 
want to do things because I, I think ultimately the, 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 the and socks are are whew, yeah I get what you're saying the antifa uh, the, the 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 let's bash the fash those people it's well, I, well, I don't think they have a, a whole understanding of of anarchy yet well yeah and I think ultimately too it's like um so I had this guy on uh I don't agree with a lot of his stuff but he was like an inspiration for me before I even did start doing what I was doing this guy Rob he was like a free man which are their own special breed too, which, <laughs> but I mean, it's cool for them. And he's in, he's in Canada resonated with me is he was just like, well, it's just about being an adult. Like I don't need somebody else to be my parent anymore. I can be an adult. So I think that's ultimately like what you want in life, right? Like that's why you're probably drawn to, you guys are, are getting drawn into farming, right? Because it's like, well, I want to take care of myself. I want to be the provider of my own food. I want to be resilient. So I'm going to start studying herbalism so then I know how to take care of myself or I'm going to have somebody in my social network that's a doctor or a nurse or what are we going to do about money? Well, there's Bitcoin or, or I can barter or yeah. I, I don't know. I even looked into like it doesn't cost much to start a credit union. So you could start your own credit union. So even if you did want to play that game, but it well, is, you, is playing a game. We right? were talking about starting up local uh, cryptocurrencies, you know, the how easy that would be to start subverting uh, yeah, ev basically everything, uh, especially if you really hyper-localized, you know, food distribution and everything else like that. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I think that, yeah, that's definitely an option too. I think there's, there's a lot of options, man, but there's just not a lot of doing. I mean, there's a lot of people that say I'm an anarchist. Well, there's not a I'm clear this, picture yet, right? Well, yeah, but I, that's that's kind of why I like your approach to things, Drew. I mean, that's kind of what I what I am. That is kind of what I'm trying to do, and what I did before this. Because I mean, I've been running, I've been running my own business. I've had a pet sitting company for over a decade now that I was running, but I was doing it, you know, on my terms, and I was working outside the bounds of the state for the most part, and uh, you know, and. And now, like like you said, part a lot of it is those reasons that you mentioned, like drawn to being more responsible for my own t for my own food, you know, my fa my family's food, mm -hmm. my food, and stuff like that. But for me, being it's your also, own man, you know. Yeah, yeah, man, absolutely, being your own man, or being, or even if you're a woman and you want to do this, like being your own person, man, being your own woman. Like, I mean, it's it's not. I mean, I think I think for us, like, it's it is interesting because there is like this longing. For like, I think like a lot of young men or men our age, I don't know, I'm 32, so I'm guessing you guys are all around my age, but yeah. there is, we are well, kind of, well, this Jeremy's place. like, you know, <laughs> we don't want to get into it. Go ahead. Oh, get over, get over. I'm not that much older than you, Dave. Get over it. <laughs> but it's like our generation, right? Like we, we're, we don't, my way in the world as a man for some reason. It took me a while. Like it took me, like when I moved like my parents split up and then I moved to Columbus away from all my family. And I, I spent like most of the time when I was a child with my grandfather and you know, my parents are super young when they had me. My dad was a good provider, but my dad was super young, man. Like he was, he was 18 when he married my mom, had his first kid when he was 22. He had me, his third child when he was 26 and he made a lot of money, but he was on the road and then he had to come home and take a significant pay cut just so he could be close to us. So then like, you know, then he's taken like a big hit in his, you know, so his like you had an awesome dad. His lifestyle. No, I, I did have an awesome dad. Yeah. But like at the same time, like, you know, it was, it was tough. I mean, I think it was tough for my dad. And then like we split up and I, you know, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with my dad. And so like it, it took my, it's, it was hard for my dad and I to build that relationship. Right. Because like whenever parents get divorced, like a lot of times mom's, We'll say stuff about your 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 dad, or they'll they'll bring personal they'll things into the relationship. Into that. Yeah, man. I mean, it's like a control thing. And I love my mom; she's an awesome person. But you know, it, there was definitely that went that went on. I mean, she did the best that she could do, though. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't hold it against my mom. But my grandfather was always this guy who was like this stoic guy who always smiled, hugged you, and told you that he loved you. But you didn't know if there was something wrong with him. Like, you, I still don't know. He's eighty four and. <laughs> but like he he was he was always like yeah he's 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 a trooper he's been run over by a dump truck drugged by a train like Jesus you know, like, Christ your granddad right. and my like granddad just, will like, have some stories to talk about because my granddad yeah. got hit by a train <laughs> holy shit that's crazy <laughs> I I'm so, here because my granddad survived a train hitting so pretty crazy yeah um 
but yeah, I mean, so it's it's just kind of like that generation, right? So that was the generation that came before us. Like you did what you needed to do to provide, and and I think a lot of times though, you know, I I think for us, like we grew up in a totally different generation. Like we grew up with, I I, I it's hard to put a place in. I mean, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Brett Vinat's podcast and uh, School Sucks and oh, sure. friends of Brett and yeah. like, and like listening yeah, to him great. talk about postmodernism and and stuff like that. And I think like. I think political correctness, and I think there there has been kind of like a, an attack on masculinity, and and like if you want to be, well, there's a reason. And, and for also that. too, I, I, think, <laughs> I don't want to get all into it, but yeah. Well, yeah, it, but also it's just like you know, there's also a sense of there's a lot of people that think masculinity is one thing, and it, and they're just douchebags too. So it's not <laughs> like men haven't really done yeah. ourselves favors, and we haven't done a good job leading a good example. For some reason, we were taught that athletes were role models and stupid shit like that when they're just people that can run fast with a football. Yeah. We, yeah. we were taught that, you know, your farmers are dumb people. We want the dumbest people to do this. Everybody should go to college. And, you know, one thing when I was a kid and I moved back to school to like, or I went moved back to Toledo and I, you know, started hanging out with my grandpa all the time. And one thing he was saying is, buddy, it's good to get an education and get this, get this degree, but... When I was working on the railroad, I had the same job as people with degrees. It didn't really matter back then, and it's probably not going to matter pretty soon as well. And then, sure enough, it's graduation time. Feel yeah. prepared to be an adult. So then, you know, I, I, I wasted five years in school, and I just got a sales job. Yeah. And it was just because I knew I needed to make money, right? So then I'm making money, <laughs> but it doesn't. Like, it just makes me a kid who has money. And then, <laughs> and then you're, party, you're right. Yeah, and then I then I start partying really hard, and then I start, uh, you know, and then I I make Pouring bad that decisions. Money right down the drain. Not responsible with it, which I was actually super responsible as a teenager going up to college. But then, oh yeah, once you that's, realize that's how it that always goes. Been, I'm right there you, with you. Yeah, once you realize that you've been lied to, and once you realize that, oh, go to school, get a good job, get with good benefits, then you you <laughs> make you you question everything. And then for me, it was like. Well, what the fuck was the point of the last five years or four years to five years? Like, you know, every every internship I got, yeah. people treated me like shit because I would question them or because I didn't know if that's really what I wanted to do with my career. And then, um, then yeah, man. And then, you know, like being miserable and being depressed, uh, you know, losing family members and close friends and like people that like died and then not knowing how to deal with it or understanding what coping mechanisms were and stuff like that. Then I just kind of found myself in this position of like I'm smart. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Oh yeah, I did a bunch of network marketing too. Lost a bunch of friends and realized yeah. that like you know peer to peer marketing when you're working for some company and, and ruining everybody's weddings and stuff like that, that's not really, I didn't really ruin weddings, but getting uninvited from weddings, like that wasn't really what, but I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I wanted freedom. I knew I was miserable if somebody else, if I was working for somebody else. So then, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what kind of happened was, is I, I had a DUI and I was supposed to start this other job. And then what happens is, is I, uh, I tell my boss, can I cuss on here? Or is this like, sure, a yeah. cussing? Go, go, go. Oh yeah, go ahead. Man. Told my boss to go fuck himself. He was this crazy cokehead. And then I get a call from my from Time Warner where I was gonna work and they were sending my offer. And then I had nothing to do. Like I couldn't get unemployment or anything. So I did what any sane human being would do. And I'd read all these John Hopkins studies and I ate and ate the mushrooms <laughs> and uh, <laughs> went and spent some time in the woods or Drove around my buddy's car and and just asked some deep questions myself, like what am I supposed to do with my life? Like I'm miserable. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like I had a purpose. And the the first thing I was told was to love myself. And then I was like, you know, I, nobody's like I hadn't had a girlfriend in years. I didn't really like myself. And then and then the second thing was get outside. And I didn't really figure that out. So I I bought this podcast equipment and I didn't use it for like a whole year. And then I decided, you know what, it's time to, oh, it, like, and I had all these other hobbies I thought I wanted to do. Like, I thought I was going to be a DJ or and all this other shit. I just, <laughs> I just couldn't commit to anything, man. Like, I couldn't. You were in I, a I didn't have trying the balls. to figure out which way you wanted to go, man. Yeah, man, absolutely. And then I started the podcast, and uh, I started that with my brother, and I was really into, like, I'd listen to Rogan's show, like, pretty much right around the time when it started. So before it was, you know, 120 million downloads like it is today, like, 
there's probably oh, yeah, less dude. than a million. And, and so like, uh, get togethers for these comedy shows and like, cause red band was from Columbus. And then, uh, I just started networking with these guys and they helped me get the show started. And I started getting these different guests on that had been on Rogan and my brother was helping me. And it was just like, man, like I'm a very conversational guy. And it's like, and a lot of people say like my style is similar to Rogan. But then it's like, who would you rather listen to, Joe Rogan or me, if we're going to have the same guests? I seriously doubt it was going to be me at the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, it depends on how much so that, you've, you've listened to Joe Rogan, I guess. Well, I don't know. Yeah, he, he may have well, had a leg up for you at that point. You know, A famous person. So, I, you know, you have to, if you're going to be successful in something where there's a lot of people doing it, you have to find a niche, right? Sure. So then I started searching for my niche. And I was like, you know, Rogan pisses me off. Like, I thought it was this... <laughs> libertarian and a super hardcore i voted for gary johnson you know i, I got sucked into oh, the, the ron paul revolution this is in 2012 mm -hmm. so this was years ago oh. years years ago yeah, yeah I mean, it, it is at this years. point it's over five years yeah, at this point. <laughs> yeah i know, yeah, I know but God, years don't remind ago. me i'm old fuck this is, a, this is a lot of growth that went on in my life guys uh i was just teasing oh, so all of us actually like, it was all of us all of us yeah i i registered sure. as so, a libertarian but never voted as one so, oh. but anyway, go on, Drew. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, boss. Go on. Oh no, you're fine, man. No, it's cool, man. I interrupt people all the time, so it's totally cool, guys. <laughs> um, going down like the the like stuff that I was really interested in, like more of the liberty stuff, because I thought I thought Rogan was kind of dumb about libertarian shit, and I was like, you know, let me go deeper in, into that. So then I started going deeper, and I went um, like I I had Jan Irvin on the show. And became friends with Jan. And then I had like, um, I had these people on like the guy, this guy, Ben Stewart, who made like Esoteric Agenda and uh, um, Chimatica and then Ungrip, which is how I found Rob in the Pagier family. And then I had Rob on. And then I started just going down the rabbit hole more. And I had uh, Davi, Davi Baker on. And my, oh, my, Davi, okay. Davi Parker. I love Davi. <laughs> Yeah, he's Dobby cool. Parker, yeah. And then my my new friend or like one of my best friends now, I had Nathan Frazier on and I had uh so oh, I started yeah, just going yeah, and I just yeah, started going cool. down these things. I had like Daryl there I had a lot of like libertarian people on. But then it just kind of I went to the Jackalope Freedom Festival and that was a good time and cuz I had I'd had Alma on and Alma invited me out and she said it's free, you should go. So I kind of bet on myself and I went like the Death Squad stuff when we we had started doing comedy shows still and so I, I was running this failing uh, comedy show promotion business, which I never made any money on, but it was still fun. And um, was doing that on the side. I'd, I'd actually started working at Time Warner again, so I started making more money. And it was just kind of like from betting on myself, right? Because I was starting to learn how to use this podcast. So I was, I was starting to you know really love myself and really connect with this. And then um, one of my first, like it's something kind of clicked for me. It was just kind of like I still wasn't, there was just something with liberty. I'm like, man, like, so what is the goal here? Like, how are we supposed to make these changes? Like, how is, <laughs> you know, do we just want to argue with people on Facebook and try to have like a, a sense of moral superiority? Yes. Or do we want to actually make a difference? <laughs> well, I mean, if you argue like, with actually people to... and, and they accept your arguments, then they go argue with people with your arguments. Then it creates essentially a viral meme. It could change a culture. I mean, yes, but the... crazier things have happened. Yes, but st yeah, st still I think nobody, if you want to, then you have a bunch of people who, who then you have a bunch of people troll. who know the arguments but don't know what to do with those arguments. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. which I mean, practical application is is vitally. I think that's where a this. lot of people are starting to venture into this discussion of practical application, and these divisions are starting to become apparent on what people actually want. You know, I I've I don't just think noticed people, in the liberty community. I don't think people know what they want in the liberty community. I, I think that I people that. originally went there because they didn't, they knew they weren't a Republican and they knew they weren't a Democrat. And then what happened was, is they wanted to be that, that different person. They wanted to be that contrarian that they, they wanted to be, they wanted to have a different opinion that wasn't a, a talking head opinion. So then they went and just found a different private talking head, like somebody like a Stefan Molyneux, so then they could just parrot what he says or like the same thing people do with Milo and Yiannopoulos. Like I went to a Milo. I, I, we actually didn't get in. It was a lot more fun like 
kind of laughing at everybody that was at the show. And uh, <laughs> it was my buddy actually caused Milo to break his phone. It was hilarious. But we didn't end up we didn't end up getting in and like, but it was like, so I mean, I guess what happens is is people have a dogma in their life, right? Whether it's the state, the pope, their parents, or something like that, and then they don't know how to remove it. So, but well, they'll take mediations, they'll take different steps. So for a lot of people, that next step is libertarianism, but they're still looking for somebody to tell them how to live their life. The responsibility yep. of figuring out how to live your life on your terms is terrifying. Yeah. Our, it's our terrifying last episode, to bet I believe, was called it's, Be Your Own Daddy. <laughs> this is true. Great, man. I haven't. I don't really listen to any podcasts anymore, so I, I meant to listen, and then it's just That's like... quite all right. I've been so busy. I listen to, I listen to a lot of books now, but what happens is... Is if I really like somebody's show, I start to sound too much like them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like uh, how Andre says says uh, sorry. Oh, you Dave mean how Dave says sorry? Dave, Dave yeah. says sorry. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, sorry guys. Yeah. I'm a jerk. I'm getting your names messed it's up. Okay. No, it happens. That I had. Like, they're not, they're not that. Show. No, anyway. it's fine. I'm a I'm a known flow ruiner. Uh, <laughs> that'll happen. But. I usually just I call it drewing it up. I just drew it up <laughs> like really bad sometimes. But but so like so ultimately so what happened was is uh I'd been doing these shows and I just realized that like look that next time when when you don't have because I I took the Time Warner job I could get capital to figure out what I was really going to do with my life. And I, I knew I could make a significant amount of money and then the the game was just going to be to reduce my expenses. So what happened was I basically shifted gears. I, I was going to move into the city um, because I was living in the burbs and I hated it. And my buddy owned a bunch of houses and it was going to reduce my rent to 600 bucks a month and I was going to have a yard. So on one of my first episodes, I talked to a guy who I, uh, him and I had similar, similar views on things. We were good friends when we were younger. And he had went in the military and I went to college and I had him on to talk about his military experiences and he wouldn't stop about talking about urban farming and growing food. <laughs> so like before I could message him to say, Hey, I'm moving into this house. Can you help me? He messaged me and said, Hey, we're going to, um, we're going to go really hard at farming this year. Is there any way you could help us out with marketing online and the farmer's markets? And I was like, yeah, man, I was just going to ask you if you could help me this, this farming in my backyard when I moved to this house. Yeah. So it was it was this kind of weird thing, and then him and I started working together. Uh, what happened? What happened next? Okay. Yeah. So we started. Uh, we started Farm to get my yard set up. Yeah. Yeah. So we we started building these beds, and we were listening to all this stuff, and we uh, we made a lot of money that first week, and then we just burned out quickly. We didn't have a cooler. We didn't have the right tools. We didn't have a lot of shit. We were just mm -hmm. doing it, and we didn't yeah. know. Joel knew more of what we were doing and he knew these different guys and he goes, yeah, there's this guy, Curtis Stone. He's, he's killing it in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. Yeah. I started, I started getting into permaculture and then I shifted gears to the podcast from comics and libertarians to like farmers or people in permaculture, yeah. like people that were actually doing it. So then um, I connected with all these people and, and they just kept referring me to other people. Like I read... Uh, Jean Martin Fortier's book, uh, The Market, Market Gardener. Gardener. Yeah, that's a great book. Yeah, and I had JM on, and then JM referred Curtis to me, and then so then when Curtis was less busy, he had me on, and then Curtis, it turned out, was like a, a big anarchist too, and I was like, oh, perfect, me and him are gonna go along great. <laughs> so then I had I had Curtis on, and then we talked for like five hours after the show, and I was going down all these different paths of permaculture, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then um, I ended up just talking to him and I just bought his course. And at first I was an affiliate for it. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do this. Like this sounds, this seems right. But then it was <laughs> yeah. like even, in, and then uh, I had Diego Footer on from Permaculture Voices. And then Curtis was like, dude, you, sh you really need to go to, to PV3. Like everybody's going to be there and then you can network and learn. So then I went to PV3. And then while I was there, this guy, um, he's also in this course, Scott Hebert, him and I were, were like, he's like, well, I was like, do you want to be my accountability partner? Um, and he goes, yeah. And he's in British Columbia too. And he's in like Chile, Chilliwack or something. And then, um, so then he was like, well, let's make it a show. So then it was like, I, I didn't really plan on like 
people swing that hard last year. And then I was just like, fuck it, man. Let's see what you can do. So I had no like nothing planned. I didn't have any infrastructure in place. And I went at it. And then um Yeah. But it was like I actually did it though. And it was like, man, but I was I was so frustrated. And I was just like and I was burned out. I didn't think I was gonna be a farmer. And then did you um, find a, a, like a here good we are to, connect on uh, wood chips? Because that's been my hardest thing ever. Dude, just <laughs> hit up uh ass plunge, man. Like uh oh, the yeah, one right. they do have you hit them up? Yeah, they they basically gave me the uh hey yeah talk to this guy and that guy said hey yeah talk to this guy and then that guy said hey yeah talk to this guy eventually you just give up i think man. people move so slow down there yeah they just here in the midwest man we just get after it and they're just like yeah we'll oh yeah tomorrow i hear about like cities that get like free compost for the city and stuff like that and like alabama it's basically like <laughs> it's, it's pretty close to night watchman man <laughs> like they I, Alabama's kind of cool. There's this book I just uh, downloaded. I was reading about him in a Wendell Berry book, and he was from Alabama. It's called. Um, well, there's a called... book you need to read about tomatoes. I'll tell I'll tell you about it after the show. I don't want to <laughs> give my secret book out, but I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, but I'm excited about this. So you change your whole podcast basically from libertarians, comedians, all this to just straight up farming. Like you're only having farms yeah. on. I mean, there's still like uh, authors too. It's, it's just kind of like that's what I'm interested in now. Like, because when you do a podcast, man, if you don't want it to fade out, like a lot of people get really weird, like, and they're like, you know, who's your, you know, what's your avatar? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, I just want to find people like me, like cool motherfuckers that are into the same shit <laughs> I am. And then I want to build a real community, which is what, what ended up happening. Well, awesome, dude. Um, that's, because, that's what like, I'm trying to do down here. Yeah, and like it's it's so it's it's so crazy the way it happened. Like I'd heard people in Ohio were popping up. So this guy, Rob Kaiser, um, he was on uh he built this high tunnel and he was on uh Permaculture Voices, then he was on the Survival Podcast too. It's mm -hmm. uh with Captain Jack Spirico. Jack's a good guy. <laughs> I love um, that but, guy. Hmm. So then like I, I went up and I drove up and I had him on the podcast. So I talked to him. And we ended up being roommates at PV3. And then there was this other guy who lived closer to us. His name was Greg Burns. And Greg was just like, uh, I, I should have connected with first, but I didn't because he was listening to my show and he would always share it and like it. It was always super positive and nice. And I knew he was doing stuff, but I didn't know like how much of like a badass dude he was. And then we uh going to do this butchering workshop at Darby Simpson's. And then he came over and... I record a podcast, help promote it. We talked about how he went from suburban lifestyle to, to living out in Zanesville. And he, he downsized his family from living in the suburbs to living in a single watt or a double wide that's been put on a basement in the hills. And he's got seven kids. And Oh, boy. Wow. Boom. And then the, his twins are so little, so they're still in his closet. So now he's got to like, he has to actually make his house a little bit bigger. But everyone's happy, man. Like, his kids love it out there. His his wife homeschools and yeah, um, I moved from a three story house to a uh, one bedroom house, like further away from the city. Uh, every uh, just so I could pay it off, you know. No, and no, you know, I no actually mortgage. had I actually had that thought to build a house out of uh, shipping containers. Yeah, I priced that out, dude. That's fucking expensive. It's like thirty five grand, and it it took a whole lot of know how that I didn't have. So I was like, well, but it looks yeah, cool. but I mean, I, I know, I know, I know a whole bunch of people who can do pretty much most of the contracting work I'd need done for on the cheap. Oh, like I'm all friends with them. So the only it, one I've seen it done right is I believe there is a permaculture farm somewhere. Oh God, I can't, it's escaping me. But what they did is they had, uh, six, uh, shipping containers, uh, stacked on top of each other, essentially. So three on top of each other, and they may they they essentially joined two together, and then used one for like a, a storage, and then a two, and then one for storage on the bottom. And they made like an apartment where interns and farmer uh, people that work on the farm could live there or rent there. And uh, they said they built it real cheaply. They got they they waited till the shipping containers were on sale and everything. Like you, there, where there's a will, there's a way for everything. Yeah, I mean, you can get shipping containers for like uh, um, dirt cheap. Yeah, you can get them for a couple like grand. 
Yeah, I was about to like between two lot. and three grand for a forty footer. It's just uh, decking I'm them just out, not insulating them, um, wiring them. Yeah. Um, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, I I had somebody because I didn't know how to do that stuff, and I wanted to have like a mobile walk-in cooler. Mm -hmm. And then I just my friend's dad didn't have a car, so I was like, well, I got an extra car. You can have it if you do this. It's kind of a piece of shit, but it, it was more than what he had, and he couldn't really afford it to get one. So he did great work, and then uh, yeah, and then uh, I actually ended up. So now I have a portable walk-in cooler. I can take with me anywhere. Oh, that's, nice! That's dope. There you I'm go. I'm about to have to find me a walk-in cooler. They're expensive. The Coolbot man. Cool. They, um, just build a Coolbot cooler, man. It's so it's you can do it for. I mean, it's gonna probably cost about a thousand bucks, but it's 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 worth it. I mean, especially what kind of farmer are, are you, Andre? Well, uh, Andre doesn't farm. He uh, yeah, uh, I, I he just got it. He just got into Dave. law school. Uh, so <laughs> he's gonna be a uh, sorry Dave. He's gonna be a lawyer. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm I just so Dave. Uh, what kind of you farming? Sorry, buddy. Uh, just who, uh, who in permaculture? Who 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 was Geoff Loudon? One hundred percent. Geoff Loudon. Jeff he's, Loudon. He's amazing. <laughs> he is amazing. Every time you watch watch anything of his or read a book of his or anything, you just every time I read something, I'm like, he's really thought this through. So yeah, he, man. Yeah, he, yeah uh, uh, he's kind of my core inspiration. Whenever I'm like, I don't know what to do, I go to I go to Geoff. <laughs> I Jeff. go to Jeff. I I say Geoff. Leave me alone. <laughs> so are you doing like so you're doing mainly permaculture then, or are you actually trying to farm? Oh, I mean, or I have, are you doing like I'm I'm making most too. of my property a zone three, if you know what I mean. Kind of. I was getting deep into permaculture, and then uh, I wanted to start making money. And so mm -hmm. I like, I forgot a lot of the zones. Like I, I don't, uh, well, they don't, there's no specific size on zones. What you're trying to do is set up to where like, if you die a, a forest, a fruit forest or a food forest eventually just takes over the area. Yeah. Like that's, that's the goal of the permaculturist at the end of the day, in my opinion, is to essentially leave edible, essentially leave Eden everywhere they step. So <laughs> sure. So, um, my roommate is huge in the permaculture. He trained with like Eric Tonesmeyer and he's got the Jeff Lawton PDC and um actually most of my friends do. It's like it's kind of weird, man. I've always been really good at networking, so I'll just find friends that are really good at a lot of stuff and then <laughs> I get him I con them into helping me. I I also do a lot of other stuff, but my main thing is is I'm trying to get up to where I can uh build up a facility to start growing like my own uh, mushrooms and stuff cuz that's Mycology is my is is my 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 main my main passion. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So uh, that's great, man. Have you have you read like Paul Stam? I think it's Paul Stamen's books, right? Pretty he's much. Yeah. Big, yeah. He's great. Yeah. Rich. Uh, so Rich is my roommate. He moved here from Connecticut. We can get we can get into that story too. But we're basically because I ended up so I I kind of got off of my story. So I ended up. Well, let me get back to my story, and I'll get to Rich. Um, if that's <laughs> no, cool no, go ahead. So, did and uh, I, it was ending, and I was hanging out with Greg. Greg had this uh, chicken butchering thing because for me, this has always been about the relationship with my food. So I wanted to start mm -hmm. doing this because I was trying to lose weight, and I was like, "Why don't I have this relationship with my food?" And my grandpa like grew up, and he said, "You need to learn skills. You need to learn these skills. You need to learn mm -hmm. how to feed yourself because there there may be a time when you when you can't rely on somebody else." And so, because like he had to, he, I mean, he told me they used to hunt honey, they used to hunt wild berries and it wasn't out of like, because it was cool to do and the hipster thing it was cause they were, they were starving. He was like from a family of 15 kids. So, yeah. you know, it's, it, it was a different mindset. So like, you know, <laughs> for me and Greg, you know, we're, we are, you know, he's like second generation He's third generation in the city, and I am second generation. Like my grandpa moved from the hills to Toledo, uh, got a job, had a family. My mom, oh, then I was born in Toledo, and now it's like okay, now I'm I'm getting back into into my roots of even though urban I'm an urban farmer, but like for anybody that doesn't know a lot about like the Appalachian. And, well, like break, every, for, most for of anybody Ohio. that is completely lost in the middle of this episode, and they're like, "What in the hell are these guys talking about?" Break down urban farming for anybody that doesn't know, like in your best words. Well, it's just uh, the best way to say it is small scale farming. So, 
you can produce a lot in mm -hmm. uh, one a hundred farmers farming a hundred acres is going to produce a lot more food than one farmer farming a thousand acres. Yeah, and it's 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 it, it it's just the way it works. I mean, like so, I do thirty inch beds. Uh, I have three sixty five <laughs> inch beds. So basically, I have my backyard. Then I have a greenhouse that I that I have mag microgreens in, and I. I can scale up to do, I'm going to scale up to microgreens in my basement. I'm taking over. I have a girl's front yard tarped right now so I can farm her front yard. Um, this other <laughs> oh, guy man. is going to give me 10, 25 foot beds. So it's like, you know, I, um, farming is just, you're, you're doing small scale farming in an urban environment. And it's, it's, it's very, I think it's like, it's, it's a bit, it's, it's my politics. That's the best way to say it. Like, this is what I believe. So I'm going to live what I believe. Like I, I'm going to cultivate this relationship with food. Um, Curtis Stone. Curtis Stone is amazing. I, I remember the, what, uh, when I got let go of my uh, corporate IT job, I uh, had been already watching his stuff for a while, Curtis Stone, because you know his video pops up all the time, makes $70,000 off of a half acre or whatever. Yeah, um, he, makes, he makes over 100 on a third of an acre. Yeah, that's insane. That's, that's, that's well, I've seen the some of these greens. farmers are putting. I've seen some of these farmers are putting out a hundred, or they're putting out a million pounds of food out of an acre. And just if you just do uh, simple math, like if you if you make one cent off of that per pound, like <laughs> you're talking yeah, crazy that's, numbers. So here's the thing: Will Allen says that, and that's he's super cool. He's doing like the aquaponics and growing power in um milwaukee but i don't really think he's doing a million pounds of food like i don't want to sound like an asshole but i totally am <laughs> who knows because i think what he's doing is important but like he's not doing that to make money like he's doing that to help this community like he's trying to what he's doing is, is powerful just like you know like ron finley too like ron finley he doesn't make money from farming he makes a shit ton of money from speaking I think well, Ron this, Finley this gets food like food desert thing is a real thing. Speech. One, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's it's it's, but it's still it's. You can, I think it's. So here's the thing: is you get into. So I got into farming, urban farming, and I got sucked in with the whole social justice thing. Like, I'm gonna feed my street, and I'm gonna teach these people how to farm and <laughs> do all that stuff. And people don't, they just don't give a shit, man. Like. If you want to make a difference, you just start doing it, and then people start asking you questions. Like, I think like I was trying to do this community lot through the city, and then all the city did was bitch at me because they didn't think I was making progress fast enough, and I was, you know, working a full time job and all that stuff. So I think it's like, I think it, yeah, I, I agree. The food desert thing is a real thing, but you know, to say I'm gonna I'm gonna grow food for my street, a lot of them don't want it, man. They don't even know how to cook it if you got it now. No, if yeah. they if yeah, they're interested true. in it, then definitely yeah, yeah like if right. somebody's interested, then definitely go out of your way to help them. Like I'm not saying like just say, you know, fuck you. No, like get excited, talk to your I neighbors. Need a hot like, pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, people won't even eat the stuff like like I'll pick a piece of chart off and I'll hand it to somebody and I'll be like, Yeah, just taste it right right now, just for the, raw and they're like, No, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> like, they I need, don't know. I need ranch. Well, they don't know how, and they, it's like, but when you get, like, I mean, Ron Finley said it best, if you want your kids to eat kale, then have your kids grow kale, and you'll be amazed what they eat when they actually grew it, mm -hmm. sure. and I think that's, and that's just it, like, get, get kids' hands in the dirt, um, but so, well, that's part of why, you know, well, they, man, then I, they I'm have this, this association of how much time actually goes into the food, you know? Well, yeah, that's part Deeper, of the, it teaches you patience, and I think Jeremy was probably going to allude to that, like, we're in this like very fast thinking culture and we want things now we want it right now we want to consume it right now and mm -hmm. you know farming doesn't work that way like you you know there's a good chance some some bird's gonna come and shit on your crop and then you have to tear it off and because <laughs> yeah nobody can eat that or you know i had like i'm pretty sure a possum shit on my lettuce too and i'm like oh you mother effer like <laughs> it is what it is <laughs> though possums. oh yeah, uh, boy well no that i was yeah well i was gonna say that's that's part of the reason why i'm get, wanting to get out of well i, I want to get out of new york for numerous reasons but a, a big part of the reason i want to get out and and get into the whole farming game to begin with is because I have kids, you know, I have young kids and I want to get them out there and doing exactly what you just said, have their hands in the dirt and learning this stuff. 
uh, because right. I, I really believe that I, I would have been much better off if I had if I had that life if I had that experience when I was their age. And uh, oh my god, I actually, I actually yeah. grew up in an you know close to an opportunity to do that because by the age of I think like eight maybe or nine, I don't remember exactly when it was when we moved. Uh, no, t- yeah. Eight, yeah, nine. By the age of nine, I was living next to a farm in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so mm. I could have, but my parents just weren't all about that. So, you know, I, I definitely want to do that for them. So they have that they have that opportunity. Uh, and hopefully, uh, like you said, it'll 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 cause them to create a create a better diet on their own just by, uh, you know, having that pride in the fact that they grew it. Well, there just also might be a time when grow knowing how to grow your own food might be life or death, you know, just and it's very easy once you figure it out. Well, that that's well, a, for sure. That that's a definite too. Um, but if you don't know, <laughs> it's like a five alarm fire when uh, all hell breaks loose. Well, sure, but like I said, that's farmers what, are like, oh, okay, I got this. <laughs> yeah, but that's why I'm trying to get out now because you know, I mean, let you, me ask you. you you're always called, yeah. talk about the end being near, like right around the corner, Dave. So you know, like I'm trying to get out ahead of the curve and. Uh, no, oh, I don't know. Five now. nukes, f- subs, and three armadas go to new- North Korea. Like, color me surprised when I'm <laughs> saying the whole world's on a teetering point. My bad. Anyways, uh, let me ask you a question, Drew Sample. When you first learned about permaculture, w- did you kind of have a vision change of the world? Did you have this like swell and berm thing, like where you look everywhere? You're like. All of this needs to be bur- swelled and burned. <laughs> yeah, no, everywhere I was going, man, I, I was looking. Um, like even other people's yards. <laughs> yeah, other people's yards. You're driving on the highway. It's like, oh, you could put fruit trees there. Why are they wasting the water like that? <laughs> what are they doing that for? Like, <clears throat> Yeah, man, you, you get into it. You kind of start acting like a born-again Christian. Oh, yeah. It really is that radical of a worldview change. Yeah, and also too, there is like um, it's interesting because there's a lot of like the we we call them purples, um, and they they're all about you know having meetings and social justice and let's pray to Mother Gaia before we do this or let's have PDCs. But again, man, they don't want to go out there and do it. They're not crazy enough that you know they want to have PDCs and just teach people PDCs and spread the gospel of permaculture. But if you want to do that, you have to do it. Like you have to get out there and plant trees. Yeah. And be crazy and and gorilla quit farming. your IT job. <laughs> quit your IT career. <laughs> yeah, quit your IT career. Wasn't just, you know, a give little your, job dog, I was doing. Give you up know? your dog business. This is like Jeremy, he's been walking dogs or ha- running a dog sitting business for I don't know, almost, 9 almost, years you said? Almost 12 years at this point. Oh yeah, 12 years. So like him going into farming, this is a completely different world change for him. You know? It's a whole, new, a whole new world, not to steal anything from Aladdin. <laughs> Do you, uh, so I mean, so what, how long had you been doing IT for? Did you ever, so did you think it was like basically a, a decade? For you? Yeah, oh, I yeah, mean, basically. You, yeah, I mean, I was in it for a decade. I have my own IT business and I'm going to. No, I, I was just like, I uh, I don't care about jobs. I want to do whatever I want. I I know I can knock this out of the ballpark. Uh, yeah, like and, a lackey. Okay. Yeah, and then I was basically a, a slave to my mortgage and my paycheck. And once I got rid of both of those, I was like, I don't want to go back to that. Even if like right now, like I have a paid off house. Like if I was to go back to take any job now in IT, I'd probably be making a lot more than I have. Uh, it would be making farming, but I wouldn't. I'm down 85 pounds. Uh, I'm more happy than I've been in a long, long, long time. My day goes kind of how I want to. I mean, I have my chores, but you know, all of this. I, lo- I love farming, man. The the minute I got my hands back in the dirt, I just felt better. So, are you doing like market gardening then too, along with the trees? Oh, yeah. I mean, you- oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like I said, my zone three is huge. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, how zone much? Three how is much the market, are you farming? Sorry. No, you're oh, you're fine, man. No, it's I, I probably, got you. Um, it's probably going to be around an acre uh, total that's going to be farmed, uh, you know, 30-foot beds. 30-foot 30, 30 beds? 30-inch, uh, 30-foot 30 beds? Yeah. Or you mean, okay. So, 30-inch, oh, okay. 30-foot beds, yeah. Yeah, I, so one thing that I noticed, and I was like, why do they always do 25, 50, and 100, or 75? And I realized it's because everything comes in like 100 feet. 
<laughs> and then if you have anything longer, you, you're at this odd fucking number of like landscape fabric or something like that when you're trying to, yeah. to do it. So that's awesome, man. Did you get a BCS and everything else like that? Uh, no. I, I just basically learned all this for myself. Oh, wow, man. You're just, you're just getting after it. I, I'm what kind of a, one of these guys where you just give me the book and let me figure it out and I do it. Awesome. What is your, uh, so are you, is your main revenue like the um, farmer's markets? Right now, yeah, it's huge. It's huge on the far, farmer's market ends, but we're, we're, we're slowly moving into a few hotels and stuff, my, my company. But yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. I, 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 I didn't expect it. When you, when you really, really hyper focus on a few things and say, hey, you know, we can get you these things, it gets your foot in the door. Most people look at farming and they think, oh, I'm going to have to learn how to do all this. Or, no, you could just start growing carrots and, yeah. and, 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 and grow 10 different carrots that are going to are, that are gonna go all year uh, and sell carrots to three restaurants and probably pay off all of your debt in five years. So what's your what's your growing season? Are you winter all time year? Then? All year, all year. <laughs> it's all That's year. Great. Random. <laughs> yeah, it's just too damn hot down there. Man. I just farm in uh, Orlando, and you can only farm the winter time. It's too hot. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then Memphis is weird. Like this guy Ray T Tyler, he's he's killing it in in Memphis. Like he's selling the grocery stores and. Um, He's doing a lot of styled mix like me. And, and so you're mainly just doing carrots then? No, no. I was just giving an example. No. What do you, so what are your main, what are your main crops? My main I'm, crops are uh, tomatoes, kale, uh, carrots, of course. You know, everyone wants carrots. Everyone wants cucumbers, those things. So what do you, how many different varieties are you of, growing? Of what exactly? the need, like because I you said find thing. your niche right yeah, oh like, yeah like if somebody want like if you're getting into farming find what you like to grow and start growing that and i guarantee you especially if you're growing it organically anybody can get into farming and start selling it at the market level like you could just go to a restaurant that says that they buy local look them up and just call them and say hey i've got these for sale for this much and I guarantee you, if you bring a sample, they'll probably they, buy them. They, they, they love to make guarantees about things. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> well, it depends on your market. Exactly. Too. I, I was going to say. <laughs> well, depends because on the diaper. So. Here's the thing. So um, I agree with you. I think it, you, know, you don't know unless you ask. And you got to be prepared for 70% of the people to tell you no. But mm -hmm. who the fuck cares if 3% say yes? I mean, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, it's just going through the numbers. It's just like dating or anything like that. So, you know, you just have to hit the pavement and do it. Like I need, I need, and, and so that I was, I was mainly asking just because I'm always curious because every market's so different. Like a lot of people don't like bigger tomatoes. They want, I find restaurants want cherry tomatoes more. Oh, it's, it's just whatever yeah. I've got right now. I've got probably 20 different tomato types growing. Uh, this is my first season on this, uh, this all of this ground over here that, that I'm farming, and I'm trying to find out what actual, you know, types of tomatoes are growing the best in this soil. So we're going to awesome, go from man. that. But worm tea is the, the key to everything, in my opinion. Tea? The worm tea, yes, yeah, specifically. That's pretty cool. I just take loads and loads of organic matter and throw it down. And then uh, I, I get quick growing plants because I'm not that smart. And then I, I just plant all my stuff green side up whenever I transplant it. And I'm just like, you know, this plant probably wants to grow. And that's, that's my attitude. I'm a little too rough, man. My, oh, I got to get back to my story, man. I got all interested in, uh, in Dave because I think it's <laughs> awesome what you're doing. I ended up we'll getting have, laid. We'll have to talk sometime. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, man. Anytime. So then uh, put your chickens with Greg. And then uh, it was the first time I've ever killed an animal. It was the oh, first time I'd feel? ever like. Um, it the killing always sucks, even if it's chickens that are dinosaurs. But I was surprised because I was a really good butcher. Like I was really good at like, and I have big hands. But I was good at like cleaning the chicken. Like once the feathers were off, I'd cut the legs off. You know, I'd cut open the vent, or I'd rip the head off. Then I'd cut open the vent and. 
stick my hand in there and clean out all the intestines and everything. And, and it was like my buddy was selling these chickens, so I was really careful. And he was, him and his wife were really pleased. They're like, yeah, you're not really, you're, you're pretty good at this. <laughs> and, then, uh, and, well, and then everybody needs to have a skill. So there you go. And then uh, he had this private party coming up, Oktoberfest. That was like our first, you know, GSD event outside. You broke of, like, the vegan anarchist nap. Oh my god! G GSD is. And, uh, Stephen Harbolt, uh, he did this uh, survival podcast meetup or event, and he sold it. And so a lot of guys from Ohio that listened to Jack's show had met up, and that's when like the, a lot of the networking started happening. And then also from like. Permaculture Voices too. A lot of guys from Ohio went to that. So then, when we we're doing Hogtoberfest, um, it was supposed to be this, you know, super secret uh, event. And I had connected a lot with uh, Michael Jordan, who's like the Bee Whisperer, and uh, oh, he was, was oh. Heath, and not the basketball player. I was and about to be excited for about a half <laughs> second. Sorry, <laughs> that like what you we were hanging out with two three. I'm just, I mean, come on, yeah. Man. He thought what we were doing was so cool. So I had these, I knew we were about to get laid off at Time Warner. So I had these free points that I'd won. And I bet if we flew these guys out, it'd be like really big for the community. Mm -hmm. And so I flew out Michael and I flew out my buddy Scott, who I'd done a bunch of podcasts with. Um, I did it all for free. I'm not rich or anything. And I just have money to spend. And uh, it was the first time I'd been to like a hog butchering. And it was like this really heavy thing of uh it was to watch somebody that raised a pig and loved the pig and then take the pig's life i mean to me that's like a really important relationship that you should have with your food especially if you eat meat like we read a we read a, a we read a wendell berry poem and then um greg and these guys at uh hand hewn farm uh had just worked up the hog and I was just getting everybody drunk and it was just like I had I, there's so much booze there <laughs> and not a lot of people hadn't met each other like Greg invited like all these people to his house and it was you know which is secluded where you know his his wife is there most of the time with his kids and everything and it's like you know he's got seven kids so that's like a really crazy thing to want to do so um so it, it went really well and then we had our next event was this uh we went down to Justin Hunt's house and we inoculated mushroom logs so we helped him knock out all oh these boy. mushroom logs, which would have taken him forever to do. <laughs> but when you have 12 people there working on it, it doesn't take any time at all. And oh, then the next event was, uh, oh, and then, and then like the next day I went to work and we all got laid off. So it was, it was one of these things. And then like, I was kind of freaking out. My buddy Wilson Marsh was over and he was in town from Texas and he was going to, uh, he's a, uh, a chicken and, uh, he does free range chicken or pastured poultry. And then he also does, um, he's starting to do pigs too. And Wilson comes from like the row crop farming background. And so his family, they're all like traditional farmers or conventional farmers. So Wilson's like getting a lot of pressure from them. Like, what the hell are you doing? And it's so Wilson's like, he's a, he's a trooper too. And he's like, Wilson Marsh, he's a, he's a, he's a pretty badass dude. So anyways, um, freaking out and then it turns out i was getting a severance and i was getting full unemployment so i was like oh this isn't going to be bad so then i'm, I'm kind of going through like what am i gonna gonna do because it's like I, I burned out so bad on farming so so unorganized and i didn't even think i was going to farm again and then um and then just kind of one thing led to the other like I, I spent a lot of time in florida and then my buddy greg was kind of like the community was really building we're doing all these events like we did a turkey butchering um, then we did like two more hog hog butcherings, and then we we built uh, two fences. We built my buddy's hoop house, and like we did we 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 did all this stuff. We came together together as a community, and we would help like farm farmsteaders as we call them because a lot of people are doing this part time, and we'd help them like be able to do a task that would normally take somebody uh, like two weeks or all your free time over the next two months, and we could get it all done in a day. That's awesome. And it was just like That's really awesome. powerful. And like it's not it's not about money, it's it's about community. It's about sharing the old ways. It's like what people used to do, what our our, our great grandparents used to do in their their small communities. So then um I was in Florida and and, and this guy uh who I met at PB2, uh, we'd hung out and then he'd start listening to my show and he's like really he was doing all this cool shit in Connecticut. Like when you talk about suburban uh 
permaculture, like he hand dug all these swale systems and he had um, it's illegally and he had chickens illegally and nobody knew about it. And he's just this, this badass guy. And he'd really want to get to Ohio because of our gun laws. And also too, just because the community here was so cool and he thought everything that we were doing was so cool. So Greg uh, was lobbying Rich. Hey, I think you would really do well working with True. And then I was thinking about with Rich, like I thought, man, you know, it'd be good to maybe have somebody that's like really big into permaculture and really gets the systems and developing systems. Cause I'm good at, I'm good at making systems better, but I'm not necessarily good at building them from scratch. I'm not really good at, I'm always really good at seeing what I'm doing. And like, it's really nice to have a fresh set of eyes on, which is why, you know, consulting so big. So um, me and Rich worked out an arrangement where he would work for me and help me with what I'm doing and he would live here for free. Um, and so we'd work this out and then I'm just thinking, well, you know, I have, I'm, I need to cut down my bills more because unemployment isn't going to last forever. And I talked to my buddy who's, uh, he's an anarchist guy too. He's, uh, he's actually, he's a, he's a lawyer by trade, but he's quitting that to do currency trading. And so, and I talked to him and he said, well, your landlord's okay with this. Does it say in your lease that you can let out your house? I said, well, I don't have a lease. He goes, well, what happens if your landlord dies? <laughs> oh yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. You'd get kicked out and, or you could get kicked out. So something before about selling my house for like, um, 50 grand and like, it was a nice house and he bought it in the hood and he got it for like eight grand and he put 10 into it. And it was, it, it, it was doing really well. So I like it, it, the neighborhood was doing well, like it was gentrifying and it still is. And so I knew he, he wanted to get it. And so he, um, to you, if you can buy it. So I didn't, I didn't have a job, so I couldn't get approved for a mortgage. So I asked my parents if they could co-sign. None of them were in a, in a position for that. And then my mom said I should talk to a certain family member. And then I did. And he said, well, tell him I'll buy it for $43,000 cash. And I was like, uh, okay, because I was just trying to get him to co-sign on a loan. But he goes, no, we'll just buy it with cash. And then I go, oh, okay. So then I talked to the guy and um, he goes, well, I really want 50. And then I talked to this family member again. He said, all right, tell him 45, final offer. So I said, 45, final offer. And then they sold us the house for 45 grand. And then this family member was like, well, look, I'm not just going to give you this house. Like, I want you to figure out how you can buy this house from me and still get credit. So I legally have a mortgage with this family member. So apparently, if you have a family member that's willing to help you mortgage on, on a house, and so he's making like 10 grand in the deal because it's he's getting 3% interest. So it's more than what he'd make in a savings account. So it's a win-win for both of us. Yeah, I found so this, then um, I found this fascinating. Yeah. I heard you talk about this on one of your shows, and I was like, that, "That's that's some." I, I had I had no idea that existed. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and like you just you don't know unless you ask, right? You don't know unless you you're like. So it's just like I wanted to, and I did. But yeah, man. And so here I am today. Like, so we're we're getting ready for the season. Um, I got a lot of more infrastructure that needs to get done, but you know, having Rich around has helped out a lot. Like, just because he's He's more of a grown up than me and knows how to do like man things, like fix shit up and stuff like that. But um, that's it, man. So the season's coming and uh, I was actually a little bit running late for this because I got to plant like 50 trays of microgreens. Not that much. It's more like 25. But, oh, but yeah, guys. So so that's uh, that's my story, man. And uh, 50 trays of microgreens. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. And I could I could talk to you guys for more, but I know we're we're about an hour and i really got to get some shit done so yeah no man that's, <laughs> um, that, that, that i actually I, think, I think that was i, think that I was stopped doing bit. shit I mean, to do really this good. podcast so yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate that dave like that's pretty cool but i appreciate you guys having me on man and I, i'd hate to just like uh talk and leave i just i just gotta no, get, it was, I, no, it was our pleasure having you on here that was fantastic i learned a ton i'm that's, actually way more interested in this now than i was at the beginning so Oh, that's awesome, man! I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad I can do that. Uh, so, so yeah. So my goal this year is 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 to make some money. Like I gotta. So my unemployment just ran out uh, this week, so I gotta <laughs> get after it. So it's like the pressure is finally coming. The cushion is gone. I still yeah. have some severance money left, but it's like 
That's just it. enough. It's just but that, enough. The, the, what it is is the train is roaring in the back. That's what it is. And you can hear it. Choo choo. Oh, yeah. Choo oh, choo. It's coming. So you got to yes. be ready to hop on. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So this is where I'm at. And so I'd love to come on again if you guys are down to have me on. Nobody ever really wants me as a guest. I don't know why. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, um, you're, you're more than welcome to come on uh, uh, to even talk or, or whatever. Uh, talk about anarchy one day or, or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, this is well. This is it. I mean, so I can sum up what I think of anarchy. Like, it's doing what you want to do with your life. That's it. Do it on your terms. Find a way to live your life on your terms, and don't take no for an answer, man. Like, if you're not hurting anybody, then it's bullshit. Like, <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah principles. Yeah. Like, have your ideology in your back pocket and live those principles. And guess what? People are going to ask you what you believe when you are impressing them or what. When you're successful with business, so that's pretty much it. So that's my my philosophy in a nutshell. Like, if you want to make change, you got to do it with business, man. You got to play the game, and you got to do it with business. So, or you got to just do it. Like, if if you want to have, have to it, do it through action, yeah, you can't sit around and and just hope it's going to change. Try it on Facebook and try to try to argue with people because nobody gives a shit, and you can't even you can't even have a real conversation on there. Like, I get on and troll because I'm a child. <laughs> but you know that's just what happens. So I, I think we all are, so. Drew. I, I think we all. Are, yeah, we Drew, are. So don't that. don't feel bad. Cool. Right. I don't feel bad. Don't worry about that, Andre. <laughs> so at least I didn't fuck your name up finally. So um, yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. And you and you pronounced it right all the way through. So and I appreciate that. Thank you. That very <laughs> Welcome, very man. rarely ever happens. So. Uh, uh, you guys are yeah, no problem. So if people want to listen to my show, you can just go to samplehour.com. I try to put out a show at least once a week. I'm super far behind. I do have a Patreon and you can PayPal and affiliates. So if you guys like my show and you want to support me, you can do it through that. But um, support this show first, the Seeds of Liberty, if there's a way to support them with Bitcoin yes. or something like that. I don't have a Bitcoin there wallet. I, I never. There is. There is. I miss that. I miss Ooh, that. Boat. You should go get a Jax or a Mycelium wallet. Just They're very easy to download on your phone. Oh yeah, I'll figure it out someday. Yeah, the, the, but the, the, uh, even an idiot like me can figure that out. But <laughs> yeah. well, hey, Jeremy, thanks for hitting me up and invite me on the show. Um, I gotta, I gotta get going though, guys. So uh, oh. I'll definitely put this out on my feed too, if you guys can get me a copy because I forgot to hit record. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't worry about it, man. I'll I'll, sh I'll shoot you. It'll, it'll it'll be live. It'll be live Monday, but I'll shoot you a copy before that. Um, but uh, yeah, man, that. definitely. Uh, uh, thanks for thanks for uh, coming on, man. This was this was great. So uh, yeah, thanks, man. Thank you. No Thank problem, you. man. I'll I'll come on anytime you guys want me on. So and and uh, hopefully I'll uh, remember everybody's name. That's <laughs> Jeremy for uh, for an email uh, calendar invite, and he never sent it. So. I did, I tried to, and I, I I've never done that before. It, it said it went through to you. I don't know how that worked. I don't know if it worked. I guess it didn't work. I don't know. No, I'm just giving you shit, dude. It's all good. <laughs> but hey, guys, I do got to run, so I'll, I'll talk all to right. you guys soon. Thank you so much for having me on. Take care, man. Take, Take care. All right. Wow. That was, uh, that was interesting. He uh, definitely... <laughs> He, he, at least he finished the story. That was great. I love how he managed to pull that all together in the end. He did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. He he finally came back around to every side, through every side tangent. We tried to take him on. That was yeah. that was expert level. He's been hanging around those comedians for sure. Yeah. He uh, no, but that was that 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 was fun. Uh, and like I said, I mean, I'm a big fan of his podcast, so uh, I would encourage people to check it out. I've especially if you have any interest in this topic uh because uh i i've learned a lot i've learned a lot just through listening to him i wanted to get to asking him about the beekeeping stuff because he just got into that too um and i'm i'm really interested in that for multiple reasons uh not only for money making purposes and the fact that i love honey but um <laughs> uh, it's I, think it, I think merrick does beekeeping too you could you could ask him as well uh i think Ooh, he they might got those cool actually, new beehive beehives that do the tap honey oh mm. Yeah. Well, the honey tap. Yeah, I've seen that. I don't know. Don't ask me how I've seen it, but I've seen it. Wow. Well, they're so amazing. If you know anything about beekeeping or anything, that 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 invention right there eliminates like ninety percent of the beekeeping work. <laughs> I, I I don't know enough about that to talk about that. Of, of course, Dave, you know everything, so I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure that I'm sure that's a hundred percent accurate. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know everything. Uh, so. Truly. I, I know, Dave. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, this. Uh, so you, you guys have anything else before we get going? 
<laughs> no, man, this was uh, this was a great show. I'm I'm really glad you got Drew on. Uh, like I said to him, I am more interested in this stuff now than I was before. I've never been a I've never really been interested in farming. I guess I always grew up in the city, so I wouldn't really. Well, you if know. you buy a house or or you live somewhere where even your neighbor has a big yard, you might be able to walk across the street and be like, "Hey, how would you like it if I grew up some vegetables on your land?" Uh, it's it's pretty simple. It really is that simple, and growing is very simple as well. All you have to do is look up some, any kind of growing technique and try it out, uh, and then you can start sub su you know getting away from spending so much money on grocery the grocery bill because food is going to keep going up with the price pr uh, the price of inflation and everything food's going to skyrocket with it so any food you can grow is like basically putting money directly into your savings account yeah to a certain extent it definitely it definitely helps but you know in order, in order, even just to feed your own family it's but well i mean it, it's probably easier when it's just you and you know maybe some maybe one other person when you have a family it's a little different you need a larger variety of food which is not always the easiest to grow all by yourself dave um although you know if you can if you can go well, of course jeremy if you can go if you can go larger with it though you know like i'm trying to do which is again why i which is why i like listening to drew and him talk about what what him and a bunch of those people are doing uh down there and and all across the uh across the country and in canada like he was saying there's other you know there's people all over the place um it's uh it's interesting you know it's 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 definitely uh lifestyle change <laughs> as as i think you mentioned earlier but it's it's mm -hmm. definitely one i think has is definitely has a lot of applications because it definitely you know even if even if you're not doing it just to to make money it definitely you know as as well you, food is set to go up 3600 percent, right That's i don't, what I keep I don't reading. know about that <laughs> I'm, everywhere i keep reading that could be propaganda but I'm i sure keep reading is. that the price of food is going to keep going up and up and up uh, everything's gonna the price of things is going to go, go yeah. up as long as there's an inflationary currency that's controlling everything sure uh we well, have let, do you guys want to talk about the fed for an hour no no we don't <laughs> no. no i don't have an hour to talk about the oh, fed okay. dave yeah. i all mean right, i could right. but i i'm not going to right now no okay all right <laughs> so yeah so well, let's get wrapping up so anyway as as drew alluded to yes we do it there is a way to donate to us uh our website dave uh, has mentioned that it should be up tomorrow the next day something like that uh but our patreon pa our patreon is still up uh at what is it patreon uh, t uh slash seeds of liberty is that how that works i don't remember yes patreons.com slash seeds of liberty and our new our new url is going to be solpodcast.net oh yes we had it we had an issue dave apparently dropped the ball on multiple things, <laughs> and let one and let one of our web let one of our uh, websites get away, uh, but that's all right. Uh, that one deserved to die a horrible, horrible death. So, hopefully, the new one will be. It was uh, just so bad, I had to let it die. With it. <laughs> so, is the new one not nap violating, or are we still going to go down there? We road? will see. Uh, it's being worked on by uh, one of our former guests, uh, Paul Gordon. As we speak, he's typing away. Okay. Um, all right cool, cool. We'll, we'll have to get we'll have to get jim jesus uh to take a look at it and give his opinion and see if it still violates the nap <laughs> since he was the one who made the declaration of our last one anyway oh, yeah. so yeah this is uh this has been this has been a fun episode our our information as dave said can be found out what is it going to be solpodcast.net within a couple yep. of days and uh we'll catch you next time peace peace, peace. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at Get Cell. 411.com that's getcell411.com 
This is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends Radio Show. I've run websites since 1996 and have used over a dozen web hosts in that time. Agoristhosting.com is the only one that hasn't broken my heart. Agorist Hosting's uptime and service is stellar, and their DDoS mitigation is the best I've seen. That's important because if you tell the truth in this world, you'll ruffle feathers. No matter what the haters hit us with, Agorist Hosting keeps our websites online. If you have a mission-critical commercial presence or a world-changing activism site, go with agoristhosting.com.